Okay, hi everybody. Thank you very much for coming. My name is Samin Vizier. I'm the chair of the symposium. And the official name of the symposium is The Future of Social and Personality Psychology, but the unofficial name is Everything is Awesome. <laughs> so I thought we should take this opportunity, since most of our field is here together in one place this weekend, to talk about the future and talk about some of the exciting things that are coming up on our horizon and some of the challenges. And I really do think it's a very, very, really exciting time to be a social and personality psychologist. So I invited four speakers to come talk to us. I think they are both the present and the future of our field, and I'm really excited to hear what they have to say. We'll take questions at the very end of all four talks. So our first speaker is Sanjay Srivastava. Is this on? Yeah. Okay. Um, thank you, everyone, for coming today, and thanks to Samin for inviting me here. Um, I'm going to be talking about uh, uh, going big, big data, and the future of social and personality psychology. Um, everyone is talking about big data these days. Uh, last year's presidential symposium was about big data, and it's been all over this year's program as well. I've been to a couple of really terrific sessions about big data. Um, but many of you, if you're not already involved in this kind of work uh, and you haven't had a chance to go to some of those, might be wondering, what does it mean? And frankly, even if you have gone, you might be wondering what it means, or even if you do it, you might be wondering what it means. Um, today, I'm going to be giving my own perspective on big data, on what it is, and how it's related to the future of social and personality psychology. Uh, my perspective is based on, my, on an ongoing collaboration I have with a group of social scientists and computer scientists called the Oregon Network Society Initiative. Um, and I'm not going to be talking about specific results. I'm actually going to plug a poster one of my graduate students is giving. Um, but I, I want to talk in, in more general terms about uh, how we can, as a field, embrace big data, how it is and is not like what many of us already know how to do, and why big data needs us as much as we need big data. Um, so what is big data? Well, in a, uh, it turns out if you go out and you, you try to look, nobody really knows. Um, uh, in a, a very witty blog post titled Tally Arconi, who actually wrote a very excellent blog post about it, but he called it a kind of black magic. Um, people make jokes about it. People in industry make jokes about it. Um, and big data isn't really exactly one thing. It's, it's not something that you can say, here's the necessary and sufficient things to say what it is. Um, the first thing I think many of us think about when we think of big data is big, the, the amount of data. Um, and in, in some sense, I've been involved, I suppose, for a while in doing big-ish kinds of data things. Um, so some collaborators and I, about a decade ago, published a paper where we used the internet to collect uh, um, data from 130,000 people. Um, it was a very large sample, and, and so it was like kind of big-ish. You know, it was great. I'd turn on the factor analysis and go to lunch and hope it was done by the time I got back. Um, but in many ways, it was not really big data. It had a large and diverse sample that was collected over the internet, but we were using very much small data methods, regression, correlation, factor analysis, et cetera. Um, and so I want to talk about three, three ways that we're going to have to change what we do in order to embrace big data, um, real big data. So the first, and I think the first sort of mental shift that's really important when you start getting involved in big data is the idea that the data are structured by the phenomenon, not by the scientist. What do I mean by this? Well, as researchers, we construct experiments, we construct surveys, we construct research instruments, so that by the time we get data in a data set, we know what it means. We've set up the stimuli, we've set up the situation, we've given somebody instructions, so we know what a mouse click means. Um, and there are lots of places where there's now big data coming into us, and there's still plenty of opportunities to do traditional small data methods on the internet with physiological data with mobile sensing. But there's lots, lots more data coming out of these in ways that are not structured around the questions we have. And so the burden of answering the questions shifts from the design part of the analysis to processing and analyzing the data. Um, and I want to give a particular example of, of why I think this is both an interesting problem and how we might be particularly well positioned to address it, something I call the curly fries problem. Um, so in a really interesting study by Michal Kaczynski and colleagues at the Cambridge Psychometric Center, um, they used a large data set of people who had filled out Facebook questionnaires, uh, uh, sorry, personality questionnaires on Facebook, linking it to their Facebook data to see how much the pattern of likes, of pages you've clicked like on, can be used to predict your personality. And they found really interesting 
pretty good evidence that you can build a predictive model, a very stable predictive model that rebuilds quite a bit of the information in traditional psychometric in, in assessments. And in the article that was published in PNAS, they listed the top predictors that went into uh, the prediction model for each trait. And one of the ones that stood out, it got a lot of media attention, it produced quite a bit of mirth, was that one of the strongest predictors of intelligence as measured by a psychometric test was if you had clicked like on curly fries in Facebook. Um, now, what, what does this mean? Well, from, from one perspective, it kind of doesn't matter. So uh, certainly, if you're, a, if you're a, an, a computer scientist, if you're an engineer, you have engineering goals. Let's say you work for Facebook, and your job is to decide which ads to serve to who so that they'll click on the ads. Well, you don't care what goes into that prediction model. You just want a good prediction so you serve the right ads to the right people. And that's sort of an engineering problem, and that has its own very complicated uh, uh, facets. But as scientists, we have scientific goals. We want to develop and test theories, and the content matters a lot. So why the hell are curly fries involved with intelligence? Um, and it turns out this distinction maps really, really well on, on something that we've been working on for a very long time, that uh, the revolutionary shift in measurement from criterion validation to construct validation. So the shift that our field underwent 60 years ago, where we went from trying to find a gold standard and build a statistical model to predict it, which ended up with things like, I prefer a shower to a tub bath on the CPI empathy scale. Um, going from that, very much like curly fries, to a construct-based approach where we view measurement as a process of testing theories about data. Um, and the curly fries, if you want to dig into it, has a lot of really interesting possibilities. Jen Goldbeck, a computer scientist, has, has suggested that homophily and contagion can, can possibly explain it, that you know, somebody really intelligent clicked like, and everybody in their network, and they tend to affiliate with intelligent people might have clicked like, and so forth. And that, that generates testable hypotheses about social processes, about how things are clustered in networks. Um, the second thing that I think is different and exciting, but also a challenge about big data, is that it's so much data that it enables and often requires new methods and new tools. And this is really a call for being interdisciplinary. I spent about a year and a half meeting with computer scientists trying to understand what each other were talking about um, before we could start to develop study ideas. But, and it turns out that we have really important complementary skill sets. Um, from data science, there are lots of methods for working with large, complex data sets. And psychologists have what the computer scientists like to call domain knowledge about human behavior. There are things that we already know, and we have methods for learning new things. So computer science brings a lot of things that we don't have. And going and talking to your colleagues in computer science can be a really valuable thing. They know about the infrastructure to do things at scale. Uh, my collaborators know a lot about random and representative sampling from large networks. And so they're able to just hand us you know, hand us, it's a lot of work for them, but for us, they handed us a, a representative sample of Twitter users that we could use in our work. Um, they know about network analysis. We've heard a lot at this conference in the big data sessions about natural language processing, a lot of interesting possibilities in image processing, data mining, machine learning. Uh, but psychology brings a lot to this equation, too. So as I've already mentioned, we know a lot about measurement. And we don't just know general things about measurement, like how to do construct validation, we have a, a very long tradition of doing things like unobtrusive measurements, which is very much like the kinds of data that you get from social media. Um, we know about specific phenomena, specific things that, that we're interested in that are related to the context where we get big data. So we know a lot about human communication, um, human interaction, and we can study how people, here's a bunch of totally random people who none of you know, um, who flew all the way to Lausanne, Switzerland to check their iPhones. Um, and we know a lot about how people communicate. We can bring that to bear. We also have a lot of really interesting big meta theories that frame really fundamental important questions. I think for social media, one of the really big, fascinating meta questions that transcends a lot of things that people are doing is, to what extent is behavior that we see online nowadays in social media a new venue, a new opportunity to express age-old motives, age-old strategies that humans have, and to what extent is new technology like social media changing what it means to be a human being? This is a big, huge question. Psychologists are uniquely in a position to try to answer this. Um, so the third thing that I think embracing big data is going to involve is a mindset shift from, uh, uh, towards, towards doing theory-driven induction and towards doing it openly in a way that we acknowledge as opposed to doing it in a way that uh, we try to sort of pretend we had hypotheses or whatever. Um, uh, and theory-driven induction is possible to do very well, very effectively, um, with big data. 
And again, this is something that we have a lot of really good knowledge about already. So the exploratory data analysis tradition of Tukey, the idea that you have a model, you fit it to the data, then you look at what's left in the data, you check your residuals, you look to see what else is there, you generate new hypotheses, you go to new data. Um, qualitative research has developed a very effective paradigm for doing this kind of back and forth dialogue with data known as grounded theory. Now they do it qualitatively, but the paradigm, the method, is very much the same kind of thing that we're able to do with big data and do in ways where we can do very good cross-validation, training and testing in order to, to avoid some of the pitfalls we all worry about, about capitalizing on chance, about post hoc prediction, et cetera. Um, the final method, m message I want to I wanna leave for you is the idea that what we already know how to do methodologically and what we need to embrace with big data are going to work best as a kind of one-two combination, neither one on its own. And if you've been to some of the big data talks or if you read some of the studies, uh, what you'll notice if you look closely is at the heart of every big data study is a whole bunch of boutique data knowledge that was gained through the hard work of laboratory and field social and personality psychologists. So at the heart of all these big data insights about psychology are expert judgment, I think assessment tools that we put a lot of blood, sweat, and tears into developing, not necessarily for big data, but that turned out to be very valuable, things like Jamie Pettibaker's Luke, uh, uh, psychometric assessments like the Big Five inventory. A lot of big data insights come from linking to, to very labor-intensive survey data from the CDC, Census, GSS. Um, and I think there's a lot of opportunities for us who know how to do very good experimental and survey work and for us who know how to do things like construct validation to, to really merge what we already know and create insights with big data that computer scientists wouldn't be able to do on their own. Um, I want to close by just sort of briefly mentioning the kinds of work that, that uh, we're doing in ANSI and in my lab, one, using one of these, the Brunswick Lens model, as kind of a, a leverage point to start to understand uh, social networks. So we're looking right now at the process of reputation formation um, at how different online attributes and behaviors affect perceptions of personality and other attributes. And what we're doing is we're showing people Twitter profiles and we're asking them to report their impressions of these. Um, and we're looking at things like consensus. We're also looking at when we show somebody the information not from a target user but from their neighborhood. So how much can you tell about a target user from knowing nothing about the user themselves directly but rather from knowing about the people in their neighborhood. Um, and we're looking at this to ask questions like, do Twitter profiles convey a consistent impression? What about a user's network neighborhood? And then how do these perceptions drive important decisions like who to follow on social media, whose information to pass on, how much you trust information, how much you share it with people you already trust, and so forth. Um, and we're doing this in a way that is going to allow us to automate and scale up so that we can start to ask big questions about how people affiliate and segregate themselves in online social networks based on how they perceive each other and act on those perceptions. And if you want to know more about this, Nicole Lawless is going to be presenting a poster at tonight's poster session um, talking about some of the, the first findings from this research. Um, so is big data the future? I think yes, it is. Um, it's going to require collaborations between social scientists and data scientists. Um, I think someday it's going to involve interdisciplinary work where everything is in one person's head. But certainly for now, there's too much. There's too much to know. We're going to have to reach out to colleagues in other fields. Um, I think for us as social scientists, it's going to involve deep changes in how we think about science. We're going to have to embrace the idea of being data-driven in a way that still has theory involved so it doesn't become Dust Bowl empiricism, but that kind of lets go of our fetishization of deductive hypothesis testing, which we all know is not all of what we do anyway. Um, and finally, I think taking what we know how to do, leveraging the best of our boutique data knowledge that we've, that our hard fought knowledge that we've acquired and the methods and paradigms we've developed and integrating it with big data investigations so that we can understand human behavior um, and build better models of how people work. Um, thank you all. Thanks uh, to my collaborators and supporters. And I guess uh, we're going to go right to the next talk.